This week on Uncover, Tom Moore. Tom has a diverse background, both as a serial entrepreneur and a Fortune 500 executive. He co-founded and built Digital Airstrike. Cool name. He has bought and sold companies and participated on boards, including CareerBuilder, Cars.com, Apartments.com, and Shop Local. I suggest you guys take notes on this one. Take it away, Jasmine. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Uncover, the podcast where we share the truths about doing business. Again, my name is Jasmine Sandler, and today I'm really thrilled this is going to be a conversation with someone I, I really you know, look up to as you know, we, this podcast is about helping people build their businesses, helping them understand what that's like to get to a point of success. And I have a, what I think a very successful person guest today, Tom Moore, who's speaking to me today from California, which is my favorite state. And um, so we're in episode eight today, uh, and we are going to talk about business building. Tom's gonna to share some of his secrets on the work that he does with tech CEOs out there in California. So first and foremost, welcome Tom. Thank you so much for being on today and taking time out of your busy day. Thank you, Jasmine, it's a pleasure. Excellent. So I know this is going to be a, a very passionate, exciting uh, conversation. But the first thing that I want to do for my listeners and the, uh, watch us on YouTube is just give a little bit of background on Tom and to be on today, meaning that I think he's a very exceptional person. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of brief on Tom. Founder and CEO of CEO Quest. Uh, they are an advisory services firm for and he's going to talk about that in a world where tech is important and more every day. And I think um, this is really where the market is going. So he'll shed light on that. And in his role, the team work with 30 CEOs of companies ranging from 1 million to 800 million in revenue. So they certainly have a focus. And I know he's going to share the importance of focus today. Um, prior to being a CEO, Tom founded and built a VC backed tech company. Digital Airstrike, which I think is a very cool name, uh, where he was the CEO, and his previous roles have included president of Knight Ritter Digital, a Fortune 500 subsidiary, where we, he was on the board of Cars.com, Career Builder, and Apartments.com. Tom has raised, you know, loads of money uh, in the VC world, and I think the people that are watching and listening really don't understand that space so well, so that'd be interesting to talk about today. And he's been on both sides of M&A transactions and has experienced is which we all know about being an entrepreneur. Um, his wife, Pagan, I hope, uh, Pagan, I hope Pagan. I'm saying her name correctly. Pagan, yeah. They live in California, lucky them, and they have two adult children. So, uh, you know, Tom has an incredible background. Uh, honestly, it's hard that to say that I put that in one paragraph. <laughs> um, <laughs> honestly, really. So, you know, the people that tend to listen in to this podcast and watch, they're, they're budding entrepreneurs or executives in transition. And I like, you know, your bio has to do with the thrills and challenges of being an entrepreneur. So would you mind sharing kind of how you're today? How did you get to a point of what I call multiple accomplishments? Well, thank you. And it, it's a pleasure to be here. I, um, you, you know, it's interesting as I, as I look, over my life, it, it, careers, I think, in some ways are, are sort of like switchbacks. Uh, you, you're like climbing a mountain. And um, there, there's a, I'll just mention a couple points in time in my career that, that as I look back on it, have been fairly decisive. Um, there was a time when I had been, been brought in uh, to uh, run the classified department of a newspaper. This was in the days where newspapers made money, right? So I, I worked for the Star Tribune in Minneapolis. And at the time, you know, my goodness, uh, classified advertising alone at that one newspaper um, was a hundred million in revenue, right? And um, we had this major redesign of the classified section that, that I was asked to take charge of, and I did it and reorganized all the classifications and everything else. Um, 
But in the way that we implemented it, I didn't listen closely enough to some of the customers and, and especially the real estate folks were hopping mad when we finally launched this thing and reorganized all the categories and ways that uh, uh, people could find their real estate ads um, to the point where I, I was literally having to go around and stand in front of all these realtors and they, they were all shouting at me. Right? They were so upset about what we had done. And it was a very humbling experience. And out of that, um, I, I, I found one of the greatest benefits that occur when, when you fail at something in business is that you learn a ton. And within a year, we had taken that feedback. We had launched Rent Right Magazine, Real Estate Extra Magazine. We had launched a website. We, we, we took the, 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 the disruption that we had unintentionally created in that market, that real estate market, and turn it into something that ended up being massively better for us as a business and ultimately massively better for our customers. And as my career went on, I, I often remembered that experience. Um, the, in, the, the other one that I'll mention um, was at the time that, uh, that I was uh, president of Knight Raider Digital. Uh, by this time, we had, um, uh, I was still in the newspaper business, but now I was working on the digital side. And uh, we had these key partnerships with digital players, had a good run. We took it from about 100 million to 200 million in revenue. And in the middle of 2006, due very much to the disruption of the internet, Knight Raider, the parent company, was sold. And uh, I was approached by a friend who was in the auto business. And he said, I've got problems in my internet department I can't fix. I think there might be a business opportunity. Do you want to join with me and start a company? And I'd been a big company guy working at these big newspapers and suddenly there I was. And so that was the beginning of what became Digital Airstrike. Some of the successes we had there and the failures led to me uh, getting excited about what I now do. And I think the big point is that as your career is gonna go along, you're gonna have these switchbacks, these moments in time when you have a key decision to make and, and it's as much, it, things have happened, what are you gonna do with what's happened? How do you turn that into something that creates an opening for the future, for your personal growth, and, and for ways to take your product to a new level or to move your career to a new level. And I, I think that's been sort of my experience. Wow. Well, I couldn't agree with you more on so many points. You know, I started my agency in 2006 and I've seen everything like pop and disrupt around me, right? And I'm not saying that I'm successful yet, you know, but I, in terms of personal and professional growth, it forces you to grow, right? You know, when, what I find in my work, and this is something I'd like you, for you to talk about, is, you know, I love that you're talking about decision points, right? And I think you need to make decisions based on informed data and sometimes from your gut, right? Um, and so there's this whole thing about focus that I see as a pattern uh, with people, whether they're failing or succeeding. So can you talk a little bit about how you, in those instances, and maybe in what you do today, able to focus in the right areas and maybe some of how your clients, you help them focus and kind of what that means? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I mean, I, I think it's always good to start with first principles, right? Leadership is ultimately about leverage. It's about taking the limited time that you have as a human being, right? And investing that time in a way that inspires others, that draws others to your cause, who in turn get aligned with a clearly stated direction and move down a path that is well-conceived executionally so that you can accomplish something real and significant. And that's always hard to do. It, it, it yeah. starts by, you know, having a vision, having a sense for, for the change you want to invoke into the world, right? And, and then following on with that, wherever you're, you know, in, it, it, I, I have the tremendous privilege, I got to say, of working side by side with CEOs 
as they seek to change the world. And it's the, it's, it's the coolest job in the world. I absolutely love what I do. Because I was going to say, that is ve it's very cool, right? And you can help them it, realize it. It's just. Cool. It's very cool. And they are, you know, in the early stages of a company, they're in this existential battle to confirm that vision or to find out where the vision is slightly off in time that the, they can iterate and optimize towards something that's real, that has true product market fit before the money runs out. And, and, mm -hmm. and you know, so first and foremost, great leaders start with that vision, but they never get handcuffed to it to the point where they're unable to see reality in the early stages especially. And that dialogue, that dance that occurs between a company and the marketplace and slowly but surely iterating towards something that truly delivers a new breakthrough solution to an important need in a meaningfully sized market, that's a, an important and exciting journey. But the people that run it, the people that, that, that lead, it, it's all about them effectively conveying their vision and listening. It's voice and ears. It's about what you say and how you shape the market by your vision, but it's also what you hear and what you internalize that helps you iterate and optimize towards something that is real and important for the market you seek to serve. That's what it's about. So I like that you're talking about that because I feel that a lot of people don't necessarily know questions to ask as they're leading. Can you talk, can you talk about that a little bit? I think it will really help people. Yeah. So one of the things, when, when, I, when I started CEO Quest, there were a couple goals I had. Um, I knew who I wanted to serve. I wanted to serve the tech company CEO, the person just like me that had been on that journey in my case, I, I was on a six-year journey building up uh, digital airstrike. And so many times I found myself at a crossroads really not knowing what to do. I really didn't know. And I thought I was an experienced executive. But here I was in this startup, and I at many, many times was struggling. And so I wanted to be there for our CEOs as they encounter those critical decisions on the journey. Now, I knew that I had a decent amount of experience from my own life and my own background. Uh, I've worked hard to try to recruit other managing directors that we have at CEO Quest who have also been tech company CEOs. But I didn't want to stop there. I really felt it was incumbent upon us and me to do the hard work to research deeply what I now call the applied science of company building. And so I spent three years working on my first book, Scaling the Revenue Engine. Um, I'm now starting to publish as of last week, chapter the, the introductory chapter for People Design uh, published, and we're gonna be publishing for the next 24 weeks. Um, we're doing that because when we get into that meeting with that CEO who's dealing with that existential battle to fight their way to existence and then eventually to scaling and great success where they can truly change the world. We want to bring into that moment of truth, right? Something yeah. of value. We want to have a right to an opinion. And as we do that, the research has informed that. And so I'd say that one of the biggest things that we try to do is to bring discipline and focus to product decision making, revenue engine, people design, workflow design, and funding and exit uh, dynamics, making sure that, that these CEOs are really bringing best practice to every one of those critical decisions they make. So I have many questions off of that. Uh, one is the CEOs, right? So do you find that you can leverage their strengths that they bring, bring to the table. In other words, what I'm asking is, I'm assuming not all CEOs are the same. Yep. So is there a sense of getting to know that CEO and seeing where he or she, a strength in one area, and then filling a void around the next? 
or how does that process work when you're actually collaborating with the CEO and getting them, you know, like you said, from existence to growth and scalability. And I know that all of those phases are difficult. Yeah. So absolutely. how do you, what's that process like? Well, first off, your point's spot on that um, there are many ways to lead and there are many ways to succeed, right? Uh, research has shown that there are actually three dominant uh, styles of leadership. Uh, one is the visionary leader. Um, Bill Gates would be a great example of that. Uh, the second is the relationship leader. And there's leaders that have exhibited unique capacity to build deep, deep relationships with their executives and to build the human capacity of the people that work with them and for them. Uh, and the third is the execution leader, the person who's just super good at executing. Jack Welch with, with General Electric would be a great Oh, example. he's my favorite. Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> so He really that, honestly is, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that, um, th that's a given. Now, great leaders are self-aware. They understand their gifts and they understand their gaps. And they wrap around them others that can fill the areas they don't care to do or they aren't good at. And I think perhaps one of the best secrets to success is, is, is self-honesty. You know, the leader that can really be bone honest about their own capabilities and, and, and weak areas uh, is gonna have a much greater chance for success because they're gonna shape a team around them that, it, that deals with that and that allows the totality. You know, at the end of the day, what are companies about, right? They're about setting proper direction, direction that creates deep fit in the marketplace, right? And then executes the pursuit of new customers uh, so that you can scale faster and faster. Um, and and, and it's about direction and it's about execution. And, and then thirdly, in order for you to unleash the human talent inside the organization, right? It's about tapping into the intrinsic motivations of the people that work for you, which is very much about a moral dimension. One of the things I talk about in my new book is that leadership is not just about directional voice and executional voice. Leadership is also about moral voice. It's about standing up for human dignity. It's about defending the desire of every human being to grow, to learn, to have opportunity, right? And so the leader that is both good at setting direction and ensuring effective execution, but is also good at advancing the culture and building people's sense of uh, commitment to the organization because they know that leader has my back. That leader wants me to be the best version of myself I can become. That's the kind of leader that is going to take their company and really create something great. Well, Tom, I'm feeling good today because uh, for you to tell me that, I spent a full day training some new intern recruits. And I sat down with them and I said, you know what, I just want to have a direct conversation with these guys about who I am you know, what they can expect. And I just got really real with them. And I said, my job is not just to teach you about social media. How do you become a leader? Yeah. My job is to be real with you. My job is to have you really learn and grow personally. Otherwise, it's a... And I tell you, their faces lit up. You know, I said, you could walk out the door and get an internship with some big company because, you know, I have a small business. They're just going to put you in a corner. You're going to be filing things or sitting on a phone. With me, you're going to... It's all action. Yeah. And I think, you know, the people t that are young today that want to be the leaders of tomorrow, people that get authentic with themselves and are willing to roll up their sleeves, I think, are the le leaders of tomorrow. It's my own small experience. Um, you know, so, and I know you talked about, we're talking now about people design. And uh, God, I've, there's so many questions that people have around this because I feel that a lot of businesses and a lot of leaders, then they can't take it to that next level because whether it's a motivational thing or they don't have the time to spend with their people or they don't know how to, like you were talking about, fill the gap in an effective way through a process. 
get to like level, what I call level two, you, you know, you hire the people. You know, can you talk about how, how you approach people design in terms of scalability? Yeah. Um, so it, it, I will say that it's been a lot of fun um, writing this book uh, because uh, the people design book, um, and it's obviously it's just starting to come out, but the, um, I, I decided with, with, with revenue engine, with scaling the revenue engine, I was sort of almost like a test textbook. I, it was very technical. It was very specific. It's very methodical. I worked from component to component and tried to really create a holistic understanding of what it takes to scale up a revenue engine. Um, really, really important. And, and I, I wanted to do it in a way that a CEO could make actionable. Um, in the case of people design, um, uh, there's also a framework, and I, I, the framework has two components to it. So human dynamics uh, and decision dynamics. So human dynamics, uh, well, I'll start with de decision dynamics are the decisions a CEO has to make episodically to update their org organization design. So you're dealing with, given um, the strategic imperatives that you face as a company, what's what are the competencies that you don't have or that you need, that, that you Maybe you do have and you don't have. What changes need to be made in the organization? And that, that's going to deal with competency, architecture, comp, all the aspects of organization design. Um, but the second part of the framework is, is human dynamics. Decision dynamics are episodic. That occurs two, three times a year, whatever. Human dynamics are ongoing, right? It's the dynamic between a leader and a follower. It's directional voice executional voice and moral voice being received by the follower as directional resonance and executional resonance and moral resonance. I'm like a tuning fork. Am I, am I in tune with you? Am I resonating to what you're saying? If the answer is yes, you'll have teams of people running through brick walls for you, right? So, so, so that, 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 that's what the book's about. And we, uh, what we're doing is trying to go through the process of defining um, how to unlock passion that leads to effective execution um, uh, in, 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 a, in a company. Okay, so when you do work with your clients, right, and you're working through the, I looked, I saw your model the other day, I was very impressed, um, and you're going through people design and you're kind of creating teams, what questions or concerns are kind of commonplace amongst these CEOs, things that you come across that you think are just kind of common questions and answers that you give around building and scaling these teams. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of practical stuff, right? So, um, for a uh, it, one of the most basic things is, is that um, when a, a CEO is trying to mobilize change, right? Change is not just about defining what has to change; it, it's about mm -hmm. defining how do you get there? How, how do you keep the, you know, the bike pedaling down the road as you're trying to put a, an engine in and turn it into a motorcycle, right? <laughs> like that, that's always hard. Now you're talking a conversation that could go on for hours. I just got my motorcycle license. So keep going. <laughs> oh, very good. That's, cool. <laughs> that's really cool. I, I, I know have to learn more about that, but, cool. um, but keep going. <laughs> but the, but the point is that, it's hard because you know day-to-day -day work has to happen, and yet these change initiatives have to happen. And so, uh, uh, one of the things I try to help CEOs with is to recognize there are methods that are the optimal methods for almost everything. And when you want to create change, you have to step back and say, okay, for change to happen, what are the pieces of the puzzle? You have to envision it. You have to architect it. You have to build it. You have to implement it, you have to stabilize it, you have to optimize it, and only then can you scale it. The skills that it takes to envision architect are different than to build and implement, are different than to stabilize and optimize, and are different than scaling. And so you have to think about membership on this project team. Who are we going to put on it? How do you get the team enough time that these people have to work on the project to make the change happen? So. Uh, everything from how to mobilize change to how to manage communications architecture. Um, you know, people throw together their board meeting 
their exec team weekly meetings, their one-on-ones with executives, they're all hands meetings, their interactions in the market, uh, and they think that all those things are separate things. They're not. They're all part of one thing, which is your communications architecture. And just as, as technology CEOs recognize they need to architect their platform, they need to recognize that the same concept is true with culture, with communications. Arch- you have to architect it. You have to think it through. How do you get the free flow of information up the company and down? How do you uh, make sure that there's employee surveys that allow issues to arise up in the company? How do you get surveys out into the marketplace so that you have product uh, feedback coming in? You're not just guessing what the market needs. You, 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 you know, all of this stuff and all the way to your board meetings and your one-on-one meetings with executives, these are all part of communications architecture. So the point is, um, I believe that in helping CEOs build great companies, I try to help them think through the method the frameworks and the, 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 the key things they've got to put in place to ensure they create a dynamic, healthy, fast-growing, market-connected company. So with all that being said, you know, I'm in the world of social media and social education for executives and strategy, and the unfortunately, the uber importance of executives and CEOs to be involved with the communications that you're talking about externally and internally. I imagine that the landscape has changed in terms of what the CEO has to take on and how much time they need to spend listening, you know, to build these businesses. So uh, just wondering if you've seen that in terms of these tech CEOs, uh, are they spending more time in the weeds (laughs) or, you know, how are they, being efficient when they need to be doing all these things these days? Do they do they have like this, you know, second level of people that are kind of just giving back that communication that look like? How are they involved? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think candidly that the, the, it, it, it's really across the board. Um, for some CEOs, they have a native instinct for how to engage in today's social uh, mobile connected world, and they do it very, very well. Um, for most CEOs, there's varying degrees of challenge. <laughs> and, um, and to your point, and so in some cases, uh, they, they've really tried to make a point of, of, of building, a, you know, that kind of proactive engagement um, themselves. In other cases, they've looked to their marketing leads to do that. And in other cases, they aren't doing it well. Um, one of the companies I work with that I think does an outstanding job in that regard uh, is a is a technical infrastructure company called Lightbend, and their CEO is Mark Brewer. And Mark and his team have been real thought leaders uh, in the emergence of the whole microservices movement, which is the core uh, to uh, what they're all about. And um, in fact, uh, there's a, a, a seminal document called the Reactive Manifesto that their chief technology officer co-wrote. Um, and, and so there's an example of a company that in their community, in, in, given their market in that technical community, uh, they have been very effective at building up a strong and sustaining leadership position. And sure enough, it has uh, stood them well in terms of their growth opportunities. Um, so I think I would hold them up as an example of a company that really does it well. Okay, Light Bend, you said, right? Yeah. Okay, I'll check them out. So what about, talk to my audience a little bit about what it takes to become a tech CEO. You know, is there a certain profile of person? Is it, is it someone from an engineering background or is it just a serial entrepreneur? Like, who is this person? You know, because I I deal with a lot of people that they sell it, they go into the next. So for what the types of clients that you work with, is there a certain type of person, certain types of characteristics? What does it take? Yeah, um, I, I would say it depends somewhat on the nature of the market and the product you're serving. Um, for those that are dealing with you know deep technical products, uh, infrastructure companies like Lightbend would be an example. Um, you tend to have CEOs that have a strong engineering background. Most cases, not always, but most cases, they have been engineers. Um, 
themselves earlier in their life or, or heads of product or both. Um, uh, and, uh, and then, but then as you look at other types of companies, me, you know, media, uh, media companies online and, um, B2B SaaS companies, you get more of a mixture. Um, so I wouldn't say that there's only one function that can become a successful tech company CEO. What I would say is the very early founding team does need to have strong engineering and product, uh, capability, uh, at its core. Now, it may not be the CEO, but it's going to be one of those co-founders, a couple of the co-founders probably are going to be, are going to be fairly technical. That's, that's I think, a given in a, in a tech company. Um, and, you know, uh, but it, it's less, of, I'd say, about the function than it is, I'd say, the common denominator of every tech company CEO that I have ever met who, who has shown success, who, who is successful. They're smart. They're smart that, you know, <laughs> wicked smart is definitely an attribute. And uh, I would say the most successful are also not just intellectually smart. They're, they're emotionally smart, mm -hmm. uh, though. I will say that that varies like that, that, you know, there can be some very successful companies where uh, the CEO may need to bring others around him or her that have that, um, emotional intelligence. Um, they, it, it's not always there, but, uh, I, I think some of the best that I can think of right now, uh, are, are also very strong with, um, connect, not, you know, connecting easily with people and understanding where people are coming from, picking up on the, uh, the nonverbal language and things like that. Um, so one, one last question, then I want to talk to you about things that you have going on. Um, so, the work that you do for the tech CEOs, it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong here, their trajectory from startup to exit than structuring company or something, right? So I'm just wondering what principles to apply to other companies, like some of the things that you do that you've seen, you know what, this could work for something that's completely not technical. Some of the folks that kind of listen on, they might be in them a manufacturing background or a pure services, non-technical background. Um, are there some things that you get involved with that, that you say, you know what, this can work for kind of any business is some kind of principle that you run by. I know we talked about a lot of things, but is there any one kind of thing that you think is really important? Yeah. Um, first and foremost, I would say almost everything that we are writing in, in people design is going to be relevant for any company. Right, uh, it, it, the, the same dynamics, the human dynamics are occurring in in, in any company of any type. Um, uh, so that's for sure. Uh, and interestingly enough, I would actually say the same pretty much about Revenue Engine as well. Uh, one of the points that one of the big epiphanies I had early on when I was writing um, uh, Scaling the Revenue Engine is that everything you ever want to know about the the nature of the revenue engine that a company needs emerges out of uh, the lifetime value of a customer. So once you can clarify, uh, in, in the case of my book, I actually broke it into five categories, very low LTV, which I think was under $50. Um, you know, this is think of it, consumer products, things like that. Um, low LTV, mid LTV, high LTV, and very high LTV, very high being over $500,000 lifetime value. Um, by knowing that, I, I can tell you everything about what that engine must look like, right? It, you, you know exactly what kind of a model, it, it, if it's on the very low LTV side, obviously it's 100% digital. There is, there is gonna be no human engagement. If you're up in um, uh, the mid or the high or the very high, you're gonna be dealing with an increasing uh, human component in the selling process and in engaging with customers. And, and that those fundamental principles apply for all companies. All the stuff I wrote about segmentation, one of the biggest things that I believe, and this applies for both product development and for revenue engine and messaging, is that everything starts with segmentation. If you don't do segmentation right, the whole thing falls apart. So uh, that applies to any business. So I, I would actually say that most of the stuff that I have seen and experienced in my life in technology um, is 
pretty relevant to my life previous to technology, especially when I was in the newspaper business and, and to, to, to many other businesses. It's just, there's obviously the economics are different, but, and there's one last point I would make. I actually think that increasingly every company in the world is becoming a technology company. That in very real ways, even companies in, in old line manufacturing are beginning to leverage their data. They're, they're, they're introducing more and more technology into what they do. So, uh, yeah. Information, it's, it's great. And I'm, I'm really thrilled that you're sharing it. Honestly, you know, it's, it's helping. I'm thinking through it. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Check mark, check mark, check mark, you know with my own business and I'm sure everyone is benefiting. So can you kind of share, I started to read, you know, on medium on the revenue um, engine. So can you share, you know, where people can, um, where they can connect with you? Do you do, how can people learn from you? Yeah. Um, first off, uh, we, uh, all the, you know, 24 chapters of scaling the revenue engine are on medium.com slash CO quest. Um, certainly if, if you're dealing with questions about how to further optimize your revenue engine, that would be a good place uh, to start. Um, and, and people design can be found there as well. Uh, obviously we're only chapter, only the intro chapter as of today, as of next Tuesday, you'll see chapter one. Um, but, uh, Every, anybody is more than I, I'd, I'd be delighted if, if somebody wants to connect to, uh, you know, coquest.com and, and fill out our little form there. And I'd be happy to have a conversation with anybody who wants to learn more. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, we're, you know, we're expanding as, as a business. We've got four great managing directors and um, have a certain amount of capacity. So if there's some tech company CEOs in New York or Silicon Valley that are interested in learning more, we're happy to connect. Okay, great. One last question um, that, you know, it's, it's, it's out of left field, but it's not. So, you know, I always ask my guests if they were a superhero, who would they be? And don't answer yet. Um, but it, it kind of points to, you know, who are you in the, in the, you're an entrepreneur, I mean, really, and you've done some great things. So, you know, you're doing something great. And do you have envision yourself as and you can make it up. All of my guests, they make up. I know I want to be Wonder Woman, right? But but other guests, they make things up. So, you know, if, you know, who's this superhero? Can you just, I want to end with that because I want, you know, people that are passionate and make things happen, there's a reason that they're doing it. You know, beyond just yeah. making money, right? So it, it's talk about that a little question. bit. I mean, for, for me, uh, I'm at the point in my life where my highest priority is to make an impact, right? I, I, I want to contribute. I want to help people that are in the place that I was in, right? As I was going through my journey and, and to have that lifeline of input and advice that can help them. I, I, I have, it's such a privilege to do what I do. Um, you know, I guess if I were to choose a superhero, I'd say Spider-Man in the sense that uh, what I'm about is wanting to sort of create webs, right? Like I wanna help link people together that and ideas together that can help people scale buildings and do great things, right? So uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm excited that you chose Spider-Man because he, he, if you knew it or not, he's actually the strongest of the superheroes and he actually is the one that has the most fans. Oh, <laughs> well, he really does. I'm really into that world. So I want to thank cool. you for your time. I know we're, we're just about up now. So, but I probably will invite. So hopefully you'll be available. But uh, again, I want to, I thank you so much for your time, Tom. It's, it's been a real pleasure of mine. It's a pleasure of mine as well. Thank you, Jasmine. Okay. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, and I know that you did, please hit subscribe on iTunes and on YouTube. You can also support us through Patreon and becoming a board member. As a board member, you will get early access to episodes 
top five lists from our guests, as well as various action plans, such as action plans for personal branding online, LinkedIn marketing, and much, much more.